Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at one of the bayonets, actually, that they're going to be selling in their upcoming December of 2017 premiere auction. This is a 1915 pattern of Bolo bayonet, and it's one of the one of the rarer US bayonets that's out there that was developed. Um, and it has, a, I think, a pretty cool story behind it. So these were only ever issued and used in the Philippines. Philippines, of course, being a US possession uh, at this time. And uh, originally these were put together because the US troops in the Philippines had standard knife bayonets, like this one, on their Krag rifles, and yet they were doing a lot of bushwhacking through the jungle in the Philippines, and that knife bayonet was kind of useless for hacking through jungle. So they tended to acquire a lot of native local Philippine bolo knives. The idea, of course, of a bolo, if you're not familiar with them, is uh, it's a narrow blade back here, but it's got a lot of extra weight out in the front. And it kind of serves as a hybrid between a knife and a hatchet. And you can use it for hacking through dense brush and overgrowth and that sort of thing. Um, an essential tool for US troops in the Philippines. Well, there was a quartermaster captain by the name of Hugh Wise, who was in the Philippines from 1901 until 1905, and he came up with this maybe obvious uh, idea that, well, why don't we have a bayonet that is a bolo style of blade, and then we can do the job of two different implements with just this one. He wrote this up to his superiors, and they apparently thought it was an interesting idea, and so the Springfield Armory in 1902 assembled 50 different bolo bayonets as an experiment. Um, in a variety of different patterns and styles. Sent them back to the Philippines, and uh, they were fairly popular, and guys figured out which ones worked best. And uh, it was looking like they might adopt this as a standard issue thing, and then instead the US Army adopted the 1903 Springfield rifle. And that ended the Bolo bayonet idea at that point, because the first version of the 1903 Springfield didn't use a blade bayonet at all. It used a rod bayonet. Now the rod bayonet was a terrible idea. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, president, agreed, well, was quite outspoken that it was a terrible idea. Uh, Springfield Armory and the Army had to kind of jump to figure out some replacement for it, and they ended up with the 1905 pattern blade bayonet, once again, uh, very similar to the Krag bayonet, but a little bit longer. So this would allow the Bolos to make a comeback a few years later. In 1911 there was a, a board put together to look into whether perhaps the, uh, the Philippine scouts needed some specialized equipment. And uh, turned out, yeah, there were some things that they could use that would be a little different than the normal gear, and one of them that was suggested was the bolo bayonet. In fact, uh, the people there just recalled, hey, you know, Captain Wise had some pretty cool bayonet ideas, uh, let's see if we can get those again. And so in 1912 Springfield put together another batch of experimental bayonets, still on the same pattern as Captain Wise had been proposing, sent them out for testing. Once again they were quite popular, and in 1915 these were actually approved for production. And they ended up manufacturing 6,002 of them in late 1915 and early 1916, sent them out to the Philippines. They were official issue for the US Philippine Scouts, and they were really quite popular. Uh, they worked really well, remarkably. This piece of specialized army equipment that actually did the job that it was supposed to and everyone really liked. Um, and that's kind of part of the reason why there aren't a whole lot of these around today, and why they're not often in very good shape. Kind of like this one. Um, they had a hard time getting them out of the hands of the troopers and the, the Philippine um, guides that were uh, associated with the US units, because they just worked really well. Um, Ultimately, of course, World War I would pick up, and, and interest in the Philippines would wane. It wasn't all that important compared to what was going on in France at the time. They never made more than the original 6002. They never left the Philippines. And in fact, perhaps one of the most interesting parts of this, um, when they were deemed obsolete in the 1920s, they discovered that there was no way to get them out of the hands of the Filipinos who had them, other than providing them with an equally high quality uh, actual bolo knife. So they did some of that. Some of them stayed in the Philippines in that way. The last chapter in this story is perhaps the most interesting, and that is in 1936 uh, these were actually issued out to the 26th Cavalry in the Philippines. Uh, the Cavalry, of course, this, the 26th Cavalry was the last US unit to actually fight on horseback. And so originally they had been armed with the US 1913 Cavalry Sabre. Well, 
the cavalry saber was deemed obsolete and removed from service, and that left these guys who are actually on horseback with no bladed weapons. And so uh, someone got the idea that, well, we ought to have something, you know, some sort of vaguely sword-like thing, and you know, there are still those bolo bayonets in the Philippines, and the 26th Cavalry is in the Philippines, and uh, someone put two and two together and ended up formally issuing 1915 bolo bayonets to the 26th Cavalry. The 26th would then fight a really hard delaying action against the Japanese in the Philippines. Um, you know, there's this common myth of, like, Polish cavalry on horseback charging German tanks. Well, that's not really true, but interestingly what is true is the 26th Cavalry charged Japanese light tanks on horseback in the Philippines in World War II. And they did it equipped with bolo bayonets, among all of their other equipment. So that would be the final chapter in the use of these in combat. And uh, as I think you can understand why uh, not a whole lot of them survive to this day. So let's take a closer look at this one, because there are a couple distinctive features to it. Just for a size comparison here, this is the standard crag pattern of knife bayonet. Uh, it's actually a little bit shorter than people would suspect, and that's because the crag rifle was a relatively long rifle. Um, here's our 1915 Bolo, and then again, just for comparison's sake, uh, here is one of the 1905 pattern uh, Springfield blade bayonets that was adopted. Uh, the Springfield was shorter than the crag, so they made the bayonet commensurately longer. And the, uh, the 1915 Bolo is somewhat based, well obviously based on uh, the 1905 knife bayonet. It's the same overall length, same style of grip handles here, same style of uh, locking mechanism. So it would attach to a 1903 Springfield, um, because of course by 1915 they weren't really using crags so much anymore. There are a couple of markings here. They are US marked, and these are all serialized. So numbers won't go above 6002. This one's right in the middle. And there's the production mark, Springfield Armory, manufactured in 1916. The locking mechanism on these is the same as the Springfield, the standard Springfield bayonet. We have a spring-loaded plunger right here, and it's going to operate two things. There's a catch right here on the front, and that is there to actually lock into the scabbard, um, so that the bayonet can't fall out of the scabbard. Now scabbards for the, uh, the bolo bayonets are even more scarce than the bayonets themselves. They were canvas uh, and didn't tend to survive uh, a long period in the Philippines to today. Uh, this spring-loaded catch also operates the actual uh, locking catch on the back end of the bayonet. So this slides over the lug on the rifle, and that hook locks it in place. The bolo does have this kind of interesting extended bird's head um, bit on the end of the pommel that a standard bayonet does not. Um, I believe that is in there simply to give a firmer grasp on the bayonet the, the standard knife bayonet isn't designed to be used as a hacking implement, because it's, you know, it's got a lightweight, thin blade out here. It's no good for hacking. The bolo is absolutely intended to be a hacking, hatchet-like, machete-like tool. So being able to get a, a good solid grip on it that you're not going to lose is quite important. These are apparently one of, by all accounts that I can find, one of the really more successful specialized pieces of uh, army equipment, certainly from that time period. Well, it may not be quite in a condition to go out and be hacking through the jungle anymore, but these are really cool bayonets to find, especially once you know the backstory behind them. And they're, because there were very few made and they were put through very harsh and long service lives, there aren't very many of them around. So if you'd like to take this opportunity to get this one for yourself, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on this guy. And uh, you can take a look at their pictures, description, price estimate, and so on. Place a bid right there through their website if you're interested. Thanks for watching.